HIV now versus HIV then. When HIV first appeared, it was initially just mind-boggling. People had no idea what was going on. It seemed like this just rash of cancers was sweeping the world. People didn't know. Uh, what they did start to realize, though, was that it was concentrating highest in inner cities, particularly in the gay populations. So cultural attitudes stepped in, and because there was already stigma against homosexuals, this furthered it, and it was thought of as a gay-related immunodeficiency. So it was immunodeficiency disease, no less. So it was GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency disease. This was something that uh, it was labeled for several years until people started realizing that heterosexuals were dying of it too. Um, not, of course, dying of actual HIV or AIDS, but people die from that which comes with it, things like wasting or opportunistic infections. So we know now a lot more than we used to. Uh, people thought about this guy, Patient Zero. There was a lot of talk about this Patient Zero, this guy who apparently got on a plane. Uh, he was a uh, flight attendant. This was a real gentleman. His name escapes me, but I'm actually glad I don't know it because I don't want to further stigmatize this poor man's name. Um, he was a flight attendant, and he was pretty sex positive. He enjoyed sex with quite a few people. Uh, it was believed that this gentleman started the HIV outbreak, and because his partners were same sex, people thought, ah, it, this is all gay people's fault. So, gay-related immunodeficiency disease. Um, however, what we know now is that there was no patient zero. Uh, HIV was already prevalent in Africa, it was prevalent in the Caribbean, and it started to show up in the United States about 10 years before anybody started attributing it to gay people. So this is not by any means related to which sexuality you have, this is related entirely to the circumstances of your life and your own behavior. So we're gonna go into uh, where we are now. There is no cure. We still have no cure for HIV. That's because this is a retrovirus. A retrovirus can change and it makes it very difficult to kill and basically get out of our population through inoculations. Since we can't do that, since we can't really pinpoint a way to stop HIV at this point, uh, the best thing that we can do is medicate. And the medicines, uh, they stop HIV from working as best as possible. Um, so when you get on meds, if you have HIV or if you know somebody who has HIV and they get on meds, uh, the first thing that's going to start to be monitored is the CD4 count. The CD4 is the T cell that HIV likes to go inside. It goes in there and this is an RNA retrovirus. So what it does is it goes into the actual T cell, your T cell, which is designed to help you. It goes in there and it says, hey, this is comfy, this is cozy, I'm making a house in here makes a little house in there, and all of a sudden it changes the way that that T-cell replicates, and that T-cell, instead of producing more T-cells, it produces more HIV. So this is a problem, so this is why we monitor the CD4 counts. We want the CD4 counts to go up, but we want the viral load counts to go down. We want healthy CD4 cells. So people will be monitoring those T-cells because when you have healthy T-cells, you're less likely to get opportunistic infections. You're less likely to get cancers, by the way, did people here know that about every seven years, the body regularly does get a cancerous cell? Happens on average about every seven years. Most people's bodies have T cells that get in there and kill that cell before it ever has a chance to replicate because they realize something's wrong. When you don't have healthy CD4 cells, if that happens to you, your chances of getting cancer are gonna go way, way up. Viral load, what does that number mean? That's the one that we hear a lot. So viral load is the number of actual little viruses that are inside your blood. When you get an HIV test, they don't test you for the number of little HIV viruses. This is an expensive and it's an, a pain in the butt test on their end. They'd much rather look for antibodies. It's much easier to find, especially because HIV can sometimes hide. Um, so when you get on medicine, it prevents HIV from being able to get into the CD4 cells. Since they can't get into the CD4 cells, and those cells that are infected can't replicate, HIV is hanging out in the bloodstream now. When it's hanging out in the bloodstream, it only has so much shelf life before it needs to replicate. 
So they're going to monitor your viral load and see how much of this blood or how much of it is actively in your blood. Um, when I go in, I get, I think it's six or seven vials of blood taken every couple of months. Uh, when I first started, it was every couple of weeks. But going in and getting my viral load checked and watching that go down was like the first of many successes. Um, so when you have a low viral load, what that means is that you're actually less likely to pass it on to somebody because it's not prevalent in your blood. It's also good because it means that your medicines are working and you're getting healthier. So these are all good things. We want low viral loads. Your viral load is going to probably be at the highest right after infection because just like anything, as soon as it finds a host, it goes crazy, right? Woo! I found a new host! So, for instance, I knew a guy who shortly after infection went in and he had a viral load in one, one tube of his blood of 64,000. 64,000 little viruses just chilling out in this dude's tube of blood. Um, we want undetectable. Undetectable means that when they take multiple tubes of blood and they test them, they can't find the virus. Of course, the antibodies are still there because you've already had the virus. So they stop looking at those. They're looking at the viral load and seeing how well your medicines are working and whether or not HIV is replicating in your bloodstream. So the medicines. Uh, when it first started, uh, people didn't know how to medicate it. It was just like, let's make these people as comfortable as possible before they die. Now it's very different. We have medicines available. Uh, the medicines that we have are often called cocktails. This term is probably going to start going away because those cocktails, which used to be upwards of 20 pills a day, taken on very specific uh, schedules, and those were called AZTs. They were very short-term pills that you had to take very regularly. Those have been phased out. We now don't use AZTs. We use higher quality medicines. Um, typically, people who are taking HIV medicine these days are taking very few pills and usually only once or a few times a day. Um, I'm lucky enough to be one of the people who does not have a lot of viral resistances. I'm able to take one pill once a day. It's like popping a vitamin, easy breezy. Um, however, even though I'm only taking one pill, that one pill is designed to make my body toxic to HIV, which means that my body is toxic, which is not good for my body. So I have to drink a lot of water. This is really important for anybody who is going to go on an HIV regimen drink a lot of water. You want your liver to function well and these medicines can shut down your liver. You also want to make sure um, when you're on these medicines that you're getting checked for things like bone density. I didn't know to get my bone density checked and I was on a medicine for a while called Complera which has since been replaced. It was replaced when it was found that bone density was being reduced highly in people who had uh, taken it long term. The, uh, the medicine in it that was specifically, it was a combination pill, it had three meds. The medicine in it that was specifically uh, causing the bone density loss is commonly called Truvada, or the PrEP pill, and that too has since been changed to make it less damaging on the body. Uh, but imagine my surprise when at 28 years old, I was out and I was running around with a kid and I went to kick a ball and my back went out and my hips went two separate ways and I couldn't walk and I was like oh, what's going on I had to do four months of physical therapy because I have the bone density in my hips of about an 80 year old woman and I shouldn't have been out playing kickball didn't know I know that now different medicine now thank goodness and I'm taking my calcium pills doing what I can but these are things that we as people who are infected or people who are advocates for people who are infected need to know these things so that we can get out there and we can say, hey, have you had your bone density checked? You might want to do that. You might need a change in your meds. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit um, to some of the other things besides bone density loss. Um, common things that do happen, lack of appetite. Uh, we see in states where medical marijuana is allowed that it's very commonly allowed for people who have HIV. This is because the medicines tear our stomachs apart, make it very hard to eat. Um, it can also make it so that you feel nausea throughout the day. So medical marijuana is being advocated as one of the sort of best ways of neutralizing that, especially because we're already taking a cocktail. We're taking multiple pills, even if it's in one body. Uh, multiple pills are going into our bodies, and it's, it's hard on us. 
So that's the reason for the advocacy for medical marijuana, although I will not state my position on that specifically. Um, what I will also mention, though, is that here in Missouri, where uh, a Sorry, I almost said HIV is illegal. That was have been really weird. Where uh, marijuana is illegal <laughs> in the state of Missouri, uh, you can still get cannabinoid medicines. It's called Marinol. Uh, the common name is Dronabinol, and it's a synthetic THC. It does not produce the same head high that uh, recreational marijuana provides, but it does provide the nausea relief. And so it's a good idea to look into for people who are HIV positive and are suffering from those symptoms. It's also really important to make sure that we are eating because AIDS-related wasting is a real thing. If we lose too much weight and, are, and then we get sick, when we do get sick, our bodies tend to purge. That's one thing that happens when you have HIV. And if you have no body weight and you get sick, your body doesn't have much to purge and you will get much sicker very fast. And that's when people die from AIDS-related wasting.